before I begin, I got to do a couple things. First, I want to, uh, I've been uh, pronouncing uh, the name of the author of the book, Glittering Vices, uh, Dr. Rebecca Conindyke, not Coinindyke as I've been saying it. So I want to apologize. And uh, I also learned as I was researching that issue that uh, she goes by Dr. DeYoung. So I'm going to use that <laughs> myself. So that'll solve the problem uh, for me in the mispronunciation. We've got a few Dr. DeYoungs around here ourselves. These will make sense later. Um, whatever, he'll see that. Okay, our scripture this morning is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Hear now the word of the Lord. Be sure of this, that no fornicator or impure person or one who is greedy, that is, an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right, greed works, greed clarifies, cuts through and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms, greed for life, for money, for love, for knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. And greed, you mark my words, will not only save Teldar paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Anyone know what movie that's from? Wall Street, right. Who is the character's name that spoke that? Gordon Gecko, right? It's the greed is good speech played by Michael Douglas, that great Oliver Stone film of 1987. The greed is good speech. This morning, we come to the fourth of the big seven here, the seven capital vices. It is the capital vice of greed, or as it was traditionally known, as I'll be referring to it this morning more succinctly as the vice of avarice. And this morning we'll examine this vice as we have done the others. We'll first try to define what it means, what it's all about. We'll secondly demonstrate what it looks like through some examples and also demonstrate how it's harmful. And then we will go to dealing with it. How do we deal with this vice in our life, the vice of avarice? How do we kick this habit through the grace and working of Jesus Christ in our lives? Define it, demonstrate it, deal with it. Let's start by defining what it is. What are we talking about when we talk about avarice? Now, uh, I got some help in this, and I think this is a helpful thing. A book by a workbook on the seven deadly sins by Maxie Dunham and Kimberly Dunham Reisman. They do this thing where they take three words that people often use interchangeably, synonymously, the words covetousness, greed, and avarice. And they define them and kind of comparing and contrasting them. And I think this really does help get at the heart of the issue. So let's think about each one of those three words and how they differ so that we can get to the heart of what avarice is about. The first one is covetousness, right? And to, to covet something is to want what someone else has, right? It's greed for what someone else has. It's greed, we might say, fueled by envy, it looks outward, and of course we have a commandment about this, right? You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. It's looking outward at what somebody else has and desiring it for yourselves. That's covetousness, greed fueled by envy. Now, greed itself as they define in this workbook is, quote, an inordinate desire for more and more. It's the Gordon Gecko definition of greed, right? It's about acquisitiveness of always wanting more and more. It may not need to come from what somebody else has. You just want to accumulate for yourself more and more. Again, it's this outward desire for more. And then thirdly, our word, avarice. What makes it distinct? Well, in their book, they define it as this. Avarice is hoarding things we have but don't need. Hoarding things we have, but don't need. Now think about that distinction, right? Covetousness looks outward at what somebody else has. Greed is just wanting more and more. Acquisitiveness. Avarice is about something inward, something in our hearts, 
about hoarding what we already have and being really uh, having a refusal or unwillingness to share it with other people. It is those two elements, hoarding and refusal to share, that gets at the heart of what we're talking about this morning, this vice of avarice. And that definition tells us something very important about the nature of avarice, and that is it's not just a problem for rich people. Avarice is not just a problem for rich people. It's a problem for all of us, right? You can be wealthy and not have this vice. You can be poor and you can have this vice. It's not based on that. I mean, wealth prevents, presents itself with us Wealth presents us with a variety of challenges. Don't get me wrong, right? The Gospels speak to this. Jesus speaks to it. There's challenges presented by it. But it does not necessarily mean that you are falling victim to this vice. But think of Abraham in the Old Testament, a wealthy guy. I would not say he had avarice. When he came time to divide the land with Lot, he said, Lot, you pick what you want. You take what's best. Abraham was a hospitable, gracious, wonderful. He shared of his wealth. He did not suffer from avarice. Think of Joseph of Arimathea in the New Testament, giving his tomb to Jesus, right? Here was a wealthy person that did not suffer from avarice. Many of the churches, we were studying Philemon this morning, that was a church that was set up in the house of a wealthy person who gave of their wealth to the church, for the benefit of the church. There are many examples of that in the New Testament. It doesn't mean just because you're wealthy that you suffer from avarice. And on the other side of the spectrum, you could be poor and have this. Because scarcity can also make you cling to things. It can also make you not want to share. It can also build into you a mentality. You talk about the depression mentality, right? Where people, you know, having been without... It can create in you this desire to store up, to stock up, to never be in that position of want again. Avarice is a problem for all of us. It is inordinately loving what we possess, hoarding it, refusing to share it. Many uh, have used this phrase to kind of get at the basic meaning of avarice, a kind of shorthand phrase. It's not what you own. It's about what owns you. That's what avarice is. It's not about what you own. It's about what owns you. That's what we're talking about this morning. Now let's go to demonstrating. What does that look like? What are some examples? And we are fortunate enough to have a, a lot of them, right? And Jesus gave them to us. There are many biblical examples of this. Let me just give you two. One comes from the rich young ruler. We know this very well, this interchange Jesus has with this rich young man who comes to Jesus, Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother also, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all of these. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving for he had many possessions. You see, the problem wasn't that this guy was wealthy. His problem was avarice. He, he didn't want to let go of anything. He was hoarding these things. He was refusing to share them. And Jesus, in a way he always does, with kind of that laser beam, goes right at the heart of the problem. And it is a hard problem. The problem of avarice. Another example in the New Testament is the parable of the rich fool. This would be the locus classicus for this problem of hoarding for the sin of avarice. Listen to this parable. And Jesus said to them, Take care, be on guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store my, all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. 
This very night, your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. There it is, the sense of hoarding, of storing up, of being refusing to share, to just having that kind of heart problem to be owned by what they own. This is the problem. This is what avarice looks like. Jesus gives us vivid pictures of what this looks like. Now, the other question is, well, how is this harmful to us? I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of a victimless crime, right? It's, well, how is this harmful? What does this do? How does this create harm? Now, I could go into like, well, you know, if you're greedy, you might go out and lie and cheat and steal. And it's true that greed can lead to many other sins. Remember that tree we looked at earlier. It's true that avarice does this. Greed is a form of it. And it could be all those things. But that's really not the problem. Not the one we're dealing with this morning. Avarice has unique problems. So let me give you how it's harmful, three ways that this is harmful in our lives. The first we see in our text, idolatry. The first way this is harmful is that avarice is ultimately idolatry. Verse 5 of Ephesians, be sure of this, that no fornicator or impure person or one who is greedy, that is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. How is avarice idolatry? Well, what does it lead you to do, right? It leads you to turn inward. It leads you to worship something. It leads you to place your heart in something else, your worship in something else. It leads you to worship the creature rather than the creator. That is the heart of idolatry. It leads us to place our trust in something other than God, right? We rely on what we possess. And what Jesus tells us is where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. That's where your love will be. That's where your worship will be. That's where your God will be. Money is not evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, but, love, but money itself is not evil. But when it becomes your idol, then it's a problem. Because it leads you away from God. That's what idolatry is. Let me give you a couple of examples of this in the Bible. There's this guy named Demas. He's a cool guy. He's a guy that worked with Paul. Uh, we read about him and, and we're studying Philemon. He's in there. He's a co-worker of Paul. Later on in 2 Timothy verse, chapter 4, verse 10, Paul says this, For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me has deserted me. This one who was following God fell in love with something else. His heart was taken over by this present world, which we can assume is the worldly goods of, of abundance of possessions, and he left. He deserted Paul and presumably the faith itself. How about Judas? 30 pieces of silver. Think about that. It's bewildering to think about it, and many have tried to conjure up. There must have been something else. William Willimon speaks about this, about how people have always tried to create. There must have been some other reason for Judas to do this. And in the film, uh, The Passion of Christ, one of the things that they try to do in that film, Mel Gibson, is to try to make it something bigger, something more sinister, when in reality it was just about 30 pieces of silver. It was just about giving your heart over to something else in other than God. Judas became the idolater. It's just about the money. That's what it can do to us. It can lead us away from God. It be, can become our idol that is harmful to our souls, to our faith. Secondly, avarice ultimately diminishes us. Avarice not only leads us into idolatry, but it makes us smaller it has a diminutive effect on us. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. Right. 
That's what avarice does. It makes us smaller. It makes our hearts smaller. We fold inward. I've used that example before. This is what these vices do. They're like that flower that was blossoming and that then kind of closes in on itself. We become inward. We don't love our neighbor and, and it harms us because we fold in. We become smaller. We become diminished. We become less human as God made us to be. And then thirdly, not only does avarice lead us into idolatry, not only does it make us smaller, diminishes us, but thirdly, it leaves us perpetually unsatisfied. Avarice is the hamster wheel, right? I mean, I don't like to pick on people, and I, I, I'm not doing this to do this, <laughs> to pick on these people, but they're famous people, they're in the news, right? So you, you, we've seen over the last year, and tragically, sadly, this week too, like two of the richest people in the world, Right, Bezos and Gates, right? Both of them end up with divorces in their relationships, okay? And these were not the, you know, this wasn't the trophy spouse kind of situation, right? These weren't serial marriage people. And I'm not pointing this out to add to their sadness or to say something wrong about them. I'm saying that for this point, money doesn't satisfy you ultimately, right? I mean, I heard that the Gates had a 66,000 square foot house. I mean, if they wanted to be separated, they could live in the same house. I mean, they would never have to see each other. But they aren't happy. And it's not like the money's going to make you happy. It doesn't. But avarice offers that out to us, but it's not true. Ecclesiastes 5.10, the lover of money will not be satisfied with money, nor the lover of wealth with gain. This also is vanity. Peter Kreeft, he, the philosopher, uh, an apologist, said trying to satisfy your life with wealth is like trying to fill the Grand Canyon with marbles, right? You can't get there. It doesn't work. It will never do. It will never deliver on that promise. It just leads you to tear down and build bigger barns, right? That's what it does. It just leads you to, into the cycle of more. That's why avarice is harmful. It is idolatry. It makes us smaller. It leads us away from God. We become less human. We also, it never really gives us what we're hoping it will give us. That is satisfaction to our souls. That's why it's harmful. That's what it looks like. That's why it's harmful. So let's talk now about how we deal with this. How do we deal with this as believers? How do we resist uh, this vice in our life? How do we kick this habit? And there's really uh, two things here. It's our trusty rubric. I think we need to do two things. We need to recognize the problem, and we need to resist the problem. So let's talk about how we do those two things. Recognize, resist. First, when it comes to recognizing it, it's really difficult. This is a difficult one to recognize, to diagnose in our lives. Why is that? Let me tell you, there's two reasons why. In uh, Dunham's book that I mentioned earlier, that workbook, they uh, quote Dorothy Sayers in there. And Dorothy Sayers categorized the seven deadly sins into two different categories. The first, she had three in the warm-hearted and disrespectable sin categories. The warm-hearted but disrespectable sins, lust, gluttony, and anger. And then she had four, what she called cold-hearted and respectable sins, pride, sloth, envy, and avarice. One of the reasons this is hard to diagnose in our lives is because it is respectable. It's hard to see because we socially excuse for it. We allow for it. We don't think of this as wrong. Gordon Gecko said, greed is good. We say avarice is totally acceptable in our lives. And the church does it. Christians have done it for ages. Think of the text I read this morning from Ephesians. It talks about impure persons, fornicators. These are sexual sins that's being talked about here. And it talks about greed and idolatry. Now, I've seen Christians walk in front of you know, places with signs that say, God hates blank. Right? You've seen those too, those horrific things. God hates gay people. God hates this. God hates fornicators. All that. You've seen that? You ever see anybody, Christians, get their signs and walk down suburbia saying, God hates avarice? God hates greed? No. Why? 
Because it's socially acceptable to engage in this sin. And that's why it's so hard for us to really see it in ourselves. And today we have this whole thing of inconspicuous consumption, right? A lot of what we do is not ostentatious. It's not out there. If you looked at my life, I can tell you the two things I've spent the most money on in my life, retirement and education. It's probably true for a lot of people. You can't see it, right? It's not a big flashy thing in my life, but I'm doing it, right? I've got that in my life. So there's this inconspicuous thing. And then I've got the whole political structure giving me cover, Right? Isn't that true? Think of the current political context. Think about what people are talking about in the political world right now, about people paying their fair share. Those rich people got to pay their fair share. You middle class people are virtuous. Nothing wrong with you. It's them. It's their problem. We should go get them. And what that does is let everyone off the hook. Well, it's not about me. I'm not rich. I'm not Gates or Bezos, right? I'm not in that class. It's not about me. That is a dangerous thing for us to do. To put the blame elsewhere. William Willimon, when he talks about this in his book on, on the sin of avarice, he writes this, Keep sin large, global, universal. Talk about the evil done to us by these wicked institutions, these unjust systems of economic distribution. Jesus might tell us that we don't need to look that far to discover the source of most of the bad that afflicts us. See, avarice is hard to diagnose. It's hard to recognize because we're given a pass. The church gives us a pass. The culture gives us a pass. We just think it's respectable to engage in it. The second reason is this. The second reason it's hard to diagnose is because it's incremental. Avarice creeps into our lives. It's like an insidious vine. It's like that weed in your garden that drives you crazy. You keep yanking it up and it's got this you know, root system that just goes on forever. Which in most of what's in my garden. <laughs> but let me give you a little parable to explain this idea of incrementalism of this sin. This comes from Mark Buchanan. It was in Christianity Today. Dr. DeYoung uses it in her book as well. There is an Indian parable in which a guru had a disciple and was so pleased with the man's spiritual progress that he left him on his own. The man lived in a little mud hut. He lived simply begging for his food. Each morning after his devotions, the disciple washed his loincloth and hung it out to dry. One day he came back to discover the loincloth torn and eaten by rats. He begged the villagers for another, and they gave it to him. But the rats ate that one too, so he got himself a cat. That took care of the rats, but now he begged for his food. He had to beg for milk for the cat as well. This won't do. He thought, I'll get a cow. So he got a cow and found he had to beg for fodder. So he decided to till and plant the ground around his hut. But soon he found he had no time for contemplation. So he hired servants to tend his farm. Uh, but overseeing the labors became a chore. So he married to have a wife to help him with the work. After time, the disciple became the wealthiest man in the village. The guru was traveling by there and stopped in. He was shocked to see where once stood a simple mud hut. There was now a palace surrounded by a vast estate, worked by many servants. What is the meaning of this? He asked the disciple. You won't believe this, sir, the man replied, but there was no other way I could keep my loincloth. That's the way it happens, right? It creeps into your life. It's a series of decisions, each one compounding upon the other. I saw this firsthand with people. I worked in, uh, for a while with a, with a wealth management firm, and you would do uh, analyses for very wealthy families, and you would do one of the things you do would be cash flow analysis. And oftentimes, I had more cash flow than they did, because what happens is as your wealth expands, your expense, your lifestyle expands, and you really live in a tight situation because it just creeps in your life. That's why it's hard to diagnose. It doesn't happen all at once. It happens over time, and we find ourselves, well, this is normal, right? You get used to it. You get acclimated to it, and you don't see it in yourself. So in order to see it, because it's respectable and because it's incremental, we really need to do some hard work. And we do that by asking ourselves some questions. 
in that book I mentioned by Maxie Dunham, she gives us some questions. I think they're very helpful. Here is one, and perhaps the most important one. Spend a few minutes looking at your own life. Do you ever ask yourself, how much is enough? That may be the most important thing you will get from this sermon. The most important distinction of what it means to be a Christ follower about this issue. It is asking yourself that question. Your culture will not tell you to ask that question. It'll say to you, there's never enough. Every commercial you see, Christianity forces you, Jesus forces you to ask that question, how much is enough? And I don't have the answer for you. It's a hard thing to answer. Willimon says, the line between need and desire gets thin. It does indeed. What does that mean in my life? I don't know. But I think we've got to be there. I think we've got to live in there. I think we've got to ask that question. And this comes down to my illustration here this morning that I hope you will remember. If you remember nothing else, remember this. You got this thing here. Now, what is this? This is a cucumber. This is frugality. Good stewardship. Preparing for the future, which we are all called to do as Christians, which is a good thing. It requires you to put something in the barn. Frugality, stewardship. This is a jar of pickles. Kosher dill pickles, which are the best. Sweet pickles? No. And dill. Where's David? He's here. The, uh, okay, so these are my favorite, by Wegmans, of course. Uh, free, uh, free commercial. The, uh, when does this cucumber... Turn into this, right? This is avarice. Not pickles themselves, but you get the idea, right? We're all living in this tension. There are these good things that we're trying to do in our lives, good decisions. We're told to be planners, to be careful, to be good stewards. We're trying to do that as a church, right? But at a certain point, that can easily turn into this. And where that line is, I can't tell you because I can't tell you I know it in my own life. But Christians need to ask the question in their lives, how much is enough? Have you ever asked yourself that question? How much is enough? She suggests some other questions. Is there anything about your life that would hint at the fact that you believe abundance of possessions will give you the happiness and meaning you are looking for? That is, ask yourself, do I find my happiness in these things? Because if you are doing that, you're going to be ultimately unsatisfied. Dunham, uh, third question, are you hoarding things you don't need? If the word hoarding is too strong, think of the clothes in your closet that you have worn, not worn for a long time and probably never will wear again, yet you hold on to them. Why are you doing that? Don't ask this question. To what degree is avarice present in the way you make decisions and relate to others? Think about how these things affect your relationships with other people. Dr. DeYoung offers this very important exercise. Think about doing this. This is a good one. Think about this. Consider the following thought experiment. Imagine that others had access to all financial records, all your financial records and spending habits, but knew nothing else about you. What sorts of judgment could they make about your character, your loves, your values, your excesses and deficiencies, your ideals and identity? Think about that. What if somebody just came in, an investigator comes in, knows nothing about you, looks at your financial situation? What would they say matters to you? That's an excellent question. A scary one. One I don't want to have happen to me. I don't know about you. What would it say about you? At the church here, we're going through this fiscal policy review. We've actually decided, let's look at what we're doing as a church. Let's look at it. How much should we have? What should, should we have an operating reserve? And what should it be? And what are all the, th we're trying to do that work. And you're going to be able to read it all. You can see some of it in church newsletter already. We're going to open the books up for people, right? We do that at the church and you can criticize it and people do. But sometimes I want to say, well, let me see your check right? What is it? What would it reveal about you? What does it say about this very issue, about how much is enough, where we are, and how we live our lives? 
we need to ask ourselves that question, how much is enough? That's how we help to recognize this problem. Now, finally, and this will be short, how we resist it. How do we resist this problem? We all got it. We're all trying to find our way through it. What do you do about it? Well, I could go into a few different things. I could talk about simplicity in our lives. I could talk about minimalism. All of these are true things. But in the historic church, in the medieval church, what the one, there was a silver bullet type of solution to the problem of avarice. It's very simple. One idea, one thing, one word, liberality. Liberality. Everyone should be a liberal. Hans, don't worry. I'm not really serious. <laughs> I'm not talking about political. I'm talking about being generous. And Hans is that. I know that much. He buys my coffee. Uh, so liberality is what we're supposed to do. Generosity. And there is a word that's related to liberality. Liberation. Liberty. Freedom. Liberality means freedom, freedom for us. What I'm saying is this, the way you deal with avarice is by giving. The way you resist this sin is by giving. It's the opposite of hoarding. It's the opposite of not sharing. You give, right? And how you figure that out in your life, how much is enough? I don't have an exact answer. The church has used a 10% tithe, an idea of that. That is a good thing because at least it gives you something to go by. And I'm not saying it all has to go to the church. I'm not doing my pastoral thing up here. But Willimon said this, and I think it's right. I think that a major theological justification for giving to the church and to the poor, for tithing of our income, is a remedy for greed. I have found over the years that giving away at least 10% of my income is a way of reclaiming part of what I have as a gift of God, as undeserved, unearned grace. For me and my house, that 10% is a sign of our freedom. We may give far too much of ourselves away to acquisitiveness, yet at least there is a percentage of our souls that is, by the grace of God, yet free. Or as Richard Rohr put it, all great spirituality is about letting go. You want to solve this problem in your life. You want to resist it. Let go. Let go of a portion of what you have as a way of resisting this, as a way of liberating yourself. And it's proportional. It might be Joseph of Arimathea giving away a tomb. It might be the widow's two copper coins, right? It's proportional. That's one of the good things about it. We can all do it. And that is the cure for avarice. It sets us free. It makes our hearts happier and bigger. It makes us more human. It draws us closer to God because God is a generous God. He is liberal in His grace. He's the God of liberality. He's a generous, magnanimous God. And he calls us to be like Him. Now this may sound hokey, but I'm just going to do this. <laughs> so this week, I know you're givers. I know all of you do this. But this week, just on purpose, do something. Do a random act of kindness. Give something away. It could be to the person in line, buy their coffee. It could be giving something to the poor or a person on the street. It could be giving something to a charity. It could be giving something to someone in need in our church. And when you do it, do it this week. Let's do, what if we all did this as a church? Think about how many lives would be touched. And when we do it, we could say, you know, I was at church on Sunday and I heard about how generous God is. And I want to be more like God in my life. So accept my generosity. That's how you resist avarice. You give, just like God gave. The God who gave us his one and only son. Let's pray.